many years ago, I was, uh, I, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society sponsored a seminar series. I went from Whitehorse to Yellowknife and Iqaluit. It came to the north my first, uh, first time and uh, hey, things haven't changed. It's still the great hospitality and the scenery hasn't, uh, hasn't changed at all. Now, when you compare Yukon with other provinces and territories, uh, I think there's a lot of things that you can brag about. Um, for example, you have the fewest foggy days of all those jurisdictions <laughs> here in, the, in Yukon. You have the fewest number of freezing uh, rain days. Uh, you have the lightest winds, and that may be not so great for uh, wind energy, but it's good for other reasons. And you certainly also have the second fewest number of hours of, um, of hazy, smoky, smoky days. So of Whitehorse, though, I did a study called Weather Winners, I looked at 100 largest cities in Canada. And I said, well, where does the various cities rank with regards to the warmest, the coldest, the wettest, the, the, the snowiest, what, whatever, about 75 different elements. And I think there were a number of things about Whitehorse that you could both curse and bless. For example, um, I found that Whitehorse, of all of the 100 largest cities in Canada, was the fourth coldest. Iqaluit, uh, Whitehorse, and um, Thompson, Manitoba were, were slightly colder than, uh, than Whitehorse. Um, the number of high wind chill days um, is rather low compared to the fact that you are a, a cold, cold city. But that light winds, it helps to uh, give you a, a better ranking. For example, of the you came, came in in terms of the greatest number of days with severe wind chill right down to the least, you came 23rd. So there are 22 other cities in Canada that have worse wind chill climate than, than you do. You know, the, it is true, you probably are, are certainly aware of it, you're the fourth shortest uh, uh, growing season in, uh, in Canada. And you know, the first Frost often arrives here in Whitehorse first. Typically by the end of August is, uh, is when you will see that. But of course, you know, it's the, the, the high sun, the plants just grow differently here. So it's not necessarily a uh, totally a bad news situation. You are the driest city in Canada. The amount of rain you get are, is the lowest. You have, in fact, of, I think there are only three other cities that have more of their annual precipitation falls as snow than, uh, than, than Whitehorse. So a majority of your precipitation does fall as the white stuff. But dryness, yes, rain in terms of rainfall, you are the driest. And also in terms of dry air, um, you, are, you don't have a lot of humidex up in this uh, so you brag about it's, it's dry heat, it's dry cold, and, and your precipitation is dry too. So uh, you have it all. Of course, I, I think I come from the more humid part of, um, of Canada. And, um, and you know, I think the uh, humidity can be good. You know, uh, you have fewer wrinkles um, <laughs> when you have humidity and less flyaway hair and and fewer chapped lips when you, uh, when you have the humid climate. Now, in my job, I've had the good fortune to talk to thousands and thousands of Canadians from uh, Gooby's Newfoundland to Yo-Yo, British Columbia. And those who know me know I'm more of a storyteller. I'm not a, really a, a scientist. I mean, the last time I published in the scientific literature, I think, was 20 years ago. So, I, I talk to Canadians about the weather and try to raise awareness of our weather and climate in this, um, uh, this country. And so I do it a lot with, to engage with an audience, I try to do it with stories. I have 35,000 weather stories in my collection. <laughs> and zillions of weather factoids. You know, the gee wow whiz, uh, did you know kind of stuff. I mean, won't save the world, 
but it'll make you a hit at your next wine and cheese party or barbecue, you'll say. And so I often think that I'm kind of like the old snake oil salesman. You know, I come into town and I, um, I, I, do a, I sell you a bill of goods, but before I sell you the bill of goods, I do a song and dance. And so my song and dance is weather stories and, and kind of weather trivia. And then hopefully, with a few of those, you'll remember that you might listen to the message that, that I have to, uh, to, to depart when I, as, I, as I leave town. Now, did you know, for example, that men are hit four times more often by lightning than women? Now, we like to think we're magnetic. I think we're stupider, actually. Or did you know that the average sneeze has the same force as a Category 2 hurricane? Gives you a lot more respect for a good gazoot type when you hear one. Or did you know that female named hurricanes kill twice as many people as male named hurricanes? It's nothing to do with gender equality, it's all in the name. You get a hurricane named Igor or Ivan or Attila or Adolf, I mean, it strikes fear in your heart. So you're certainly going to follow that evacuation route. But what about, like last year, female named hurricanes? Debbie, <laughs> or Flo, <laughs> or Patty. I mean, it doesn't strike fear in my heart. Patty, I think of Peppermint Patty, you know? I mean, it just doesn't do it. So I think if we named hurricanes, female named hurricanes, after, you know, things like Gertrude, or Zelda, or Broomhilda, I think we'd find fewer deaths from hurricanes uh, uh, in uh, hurricane country. Now. The stories I like to tell are one of survival stories. You know, our history books are replete with examples of too variable a climate, too unpredictable the, the weather. There was a fellow in Fort Erie, Ontario, who did the most unthinkable thing. He left home without getting a weather forecast. I think it's the only Canadian that I know of who ever did that, you say. And he, this is important. He was going skydiving for the first time. And when he jumped out of the plane, instead of going down, he went up. He got caught up in a massive updraft that carried him through a cloud. He cut his parachute. He did a 600 meter free fall, opened his second parachute. The winds were pretty strong at the surface. Reinflated his parachute, dragged him through a fence, through a trees, broke nearly every bone in his body. But he learned that in this country, you don't leave home without getting the weather word, you say. There was a farmer in Didsbury, Alberta, that defied all odds. He was hit directly by lightning and survived. I mean, this is 10,000 times the power of the electric chair. And he survived. Now, when he woke up, he could feel, he could smell his hair and his flesh burning. His waistband, uh, I, I mean, his shirt was gone. The only thing left on him was the waistband on his underwear that said Fruit of the Loom. <laughs> but he survived a, a direct hit of, um, of lightning. Now, my favorite, I look back over the years and I looked at my favorite Yukon weather stories, and I have hundreds of them. But they all seem to focus on cold weather. And, and my, one of my favorite stories of all time, I remember the dates, I remember the, the particulars about this. The, the, the coldest moment in North America history was here at course, you know it. I mean, it's, you can't be a Yukoner without knowing snag, Yukon. February the 3rd, 1947, minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 63 degrees C. And um, on that fateful morning, there were 18 male employees at the, at the snag um, emergency landing strip, the part of the Northwest staging route. They became instant heroes around the world. The cho chosen frozen, or the frozen chosen. And newspapers from around Europe contacted them. The Globe and Mail did a front page newspaper story on them. Americans came up five days later on a military plane of media. They wanted to know what it was like to live and work when the temperature was so cold. Of course, the, the 18 men were more eager to learn about the contents of that airplane that came in five days later, and it had lots of meat, beer, and rye on that uh, plane, and they, they were keen on, uh, on that. 
But really it was in fact an amazing situation with regards to measuring that temperature and the calibration of the thermometer in Toronto and the declaration that this was the coldest moment in North America history and still stands uh, today. And it was about life, what it was like back then. And, and uh, you know, it was um, uh, your, your vapor trails when you walked, it just hung in the air for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards. You could never get lost in a situation like that. The, they were trappers too. They tra had trap lines. All the, the, the wildlife disappeared. Ravens and, and uh, uh, rabbits, mice couldn't, couldn't be found. And noises. I mean, the plane, when it landed, it was deafening. You could hear it three, 30 kilometers away. And when it landed, it was just absolutely uh, 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 incredible uh, sounds. When you, you spit, your, your saliva formed a ball before it hit the ground. It bounced off of the, off the ground. So it was clearly a, a, a fascinating and interesting um, and historic um, time. Years later, at the beginning of the uh, century, there were temperatures were pretty cold too, minus well below minus 40, close to, to minus 50 on occasions. And what I was fascinated by was the fact that there were a lot of people who succumbed to those cold temperatures. You know, they were caught outdoors and they were just, they just died. But in many cases, they were, when they were discovered, you know, stiff from frozen to death, they were nude. And what they found was that physiologists have looked at this and said that, you know, there's a, there was a thought that perhaps just as they were going to die, they felt a warmth. And, and so often they disrobed, and uh, that was something that was uh, a bit odd. In those early days, they used to call cold, whenever there was a cold moment, of course we now would call it, you know, the polar vortex, we call it the, you know, or any kind of major storm that comes, we, we often describe it as, you know, uh, a snowmageddon or the, um, the snow apocalypse, uh, um, you know, we use such words as the storm of the century. Back then, it was just the weather was considered to be challenging, invigorating, and they would often call it king, the frost king, or the storm king, or the ice king, was uh, an extreme weather event back in those, um, uh, on those, uh, those times. Um, and um, on one, that same occasion, there was a stagecoach from Dawson to Whitehorse, and um, the drivers and the horses bled profusely through their nostrils in a very cold kind of conditions. In fact, the weather turned bitterly cold on that occasion in a, a place called Crooked Creek. I don't know where that is. They said the wind was so strong that it would blow the hair off a dog. I mean, that was rather descriptive, I thought. Well, you know, I think getting Canadians interested in the weather is like asking us to breathe. We talk about it, we gab about it, we write about it, almost if it's gonna run out. And of course it always does, only to be renewed by, by more, more weather. Every night at 11 o'clock, the last thing we do before we go to bed is we get the weather forecast. First thing we do in the morning, we wake up and get a weather forecast. My friends in radio often say, David, we're always getting inter, uh, uh, complaints from listeners saying you're interrupting weather broadcasts with news, music, and commercials, you say. So, you know, we are a nation of chronic weather junkies. We can't go two hours without needing a, a weather fix. And I think our climate has made us a rather creative and inventive people. You know, Canadians, what have we invented? Well, pablum and zipper and uh, instant replay and insulin, these are well known. But also think about what we've invented because of the cold demands of the Canadian environment. Uh, a frozen fish, covered shopping malls, uh, a polar fleece, all weather asphalt, uh, uh, the, the snowmobile, the snowplow, the snow shovel, all Canadian inventions. Ice wine, well, maybe invented by the Germans, but perfected by Canadians. Um, winterized baby buggies and shopping carts. Testicle warmers for cattle is a Canadian invention, you see? So, you know, we've done it all, do you say? I often say that if you want to know the many dimensions and the fickleness of the Canadian weather, Look into a Canadian's wardrobe. We have it all. Muscle shirts and tank tops and snow pants and balaclavas. Uh, uh, we spend more money on clothes than any other people in the world. And not because we're fashion conscious. 
And it doesn't matter how silly we look when we dress up for the weather in this, uh, uh, in this country, you see. Now, I think the, um, I often say that um, we live in one of the healthiest and safest climates in the world. I mean, more Canadians die falling out of bed than die from weather. And it's not that we have a gentle climate, though, in this country. We are, in fact, in this country, the flashpoint between cold air to the north and warm air to the south. And what is weather? It's when warm air dukes it up with cold air. So it's almost like a battleground across uh, Canada for, um, for weather as polar air and tropical air uh, uh, get, get, uh, get mixed up, you say. So now, as you can tell, I've been in this business a, a long time. Um, I began with Environment uh, Canada, or Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, before it was even a thought. Um, and in two years from now, Environment Canada will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. And the Weather Service, that same year, will be celebrating its 150th anniversary. No, it didn't begin back then, but, uh, you know, it is, uh, and I have to say this, because I'm very proud to be part. I mean, you can't be with a company for 50-some years and not be proud of, of working with them. And I certainly think that it's a story, Environment Canada, the Weather Service, is a story of one of the oldest scientific organizations in Canada, one with um, a very proud history and with several remarkable achievements. And today in Canada, we, s we serve 12 times the number of people that we began serving back in the 18, um, uh, 1870s. Uh, when we, uh, but we've served them all. And you know, it doesn't matter whether, whatever Canadian, whether you're an Aboriginal on an ice floe in the Arctic or a hearing impaired child in, in um, Watson Lake, um, you clearly have access to, to weather forecasts. And, um, and I'm, of course, I'm a bit biased. I think that it's one of the reasons why government exists, to provide services like weather services. And uh, I think it is also uh, one where, for us, we know it. We have statistics that show it. We're probably uh, the one department or service within the department that touches Canadians more directly and more often than than other uh, government uh, uh, organizations. And you think of the thick of the millions of decisions that are made every day in Canada based on weather information that originates from uh, Environment uh, Canada. I mean, one thing that we're all united on in Canada is our need to know the weather. 92% of Canadians begin the day by getting a weather forecast. Again, information data that, that originates from um, Environment Canada, and all for about two pennies a day. I think it's one of the best bargains of, um, of, of government. Now, 180 years ago, um, the orientation of the Weather Service was as it is today, and saving lives and security and safety of uh, Canadians. We're still doing now what we did hundred and almost 150 years ago issuing weather warnings on the Great Lakes and the Atlantic uh, seaboard. Of course, we're doing much more now than we have in the, uh, in the past. And one of the most remarkable, I think, stories of Environment Canada and the Weather Service is the way we, in fact, have distributed, disseminated weather forecasts. You know, we've always, every meteorologist knows that it doesn't matter how accurate the forecast is, it is useless if it can't get in the hands of people that can make some use of it, some utility from it. And, um, and you know, we've always been at the cutting edge of providing information and um, uh, weather information and, and a means of getting that product to Canadians. You know, 150 years ago, um, if you wanted to get a forecast, well, you could go walk down. I mean, there was a forecast issued every day except Sunday, because there was no weather on Sunday. And, and you would go down, and the th weather was forecast uh, posted at 10 o'clock in the morning. And you could go down to the telegraph office or the city hall or the train station, and there it would be posted on the board. And there would be dozens of people coming down there to read what today's forecast was. 
Um, or you could go to newspapers. Newspaper editors hated the fact that people bought newspapers to find out in the little corner, up in the upper, lower, upper right corner, what the weather for the day was going to be. Or if you wanted to know what the weather was going to be, you could mail it. Because in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver, you could mail a letter at 11 o'clock in the morning and get it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in that city. So, hey, it didn't, didn't, didn't make sense you could mail the forecast for that particular day. Or if you wanted to phone the operator, and she would have always the forecast that you could ask her, and, and she would uh, uh, provide it um, uh, to you. There was also um, uh, uh, an interesting way that we issued forecasts. Uh, uh, tr uh, train agents would take the forecast at 10 o'clock, and they'd have a large alum uh, sort of metal symbol and it was like a crescent moon, it meant showers. If it was a full moon, it meant fair day. And so they would stick, uh, fix the, the symbol onto the train, and the train will go across the countryside. Farmers could look and see, oh, gonna be showery today. So that's how they got their forecast. The problem is that the train agents were never paid any more money for this, and so they got kind of tired of doing it. And so they wouldn't always change the symbols. So you kind of didn't know whether that was yesterday's forecast or today. So there was a bit of a, a, a disappearance of that, uh, that kind. Now, I, this, all this is the leads to say that we're very proud of the fact that last week we launched our new application called WeatherCan. And it is, uh, if you haven't got it, you should download it. It's exciting, it's interesting, and a lot of, a lot of good words have been said about that in both Elisa and Marilyn, who were very much part of that team that, that launched that uh, particular uh, product. Now, as I said a few minutes ago, I've been in this business a, a long time, and, and I think I remember my very first media interview. It was with Global Television back in the 70s. And this was a decade that was very cold and very snowy. And they wanted to know should we look to the north every morning to see if that ice front was closing in on us? So, you know, we've gone from the ice age cometh to now the overheated planet. And I've been around for both of those things, and those usually occur in, in eons of geological time, you say. But, you know, I think what we've seen in the last, say, uh, 25 years is really an incredible improvement in our understanding of the global climate system and the impacts, the effects that it has on people, places, and things. And hey, we've even ventured into that area of maybe we should do something about it, you say. And so I, I think that to me, we've seen really huge changes in our understanding of it. I mean, it used to be that climate change was, was something that was global or, or hemispheric. And now, you know, people are talking about climate change as being something happening locally. And we know that things that happen locally to us matter more than those things that, that happen on the other side of the world. And that I think climate change began to hit home when it started hitting our homes. Uh, we have seen climate uh, used to be considered to be something that occurred in centuries of time. You know, half centuries or centuries or longer. Now it's 10 days or, or 10, uh, a decade or shorter we're seeing these kind of, uh, of changes. There seems to be much more evident, much more interest instead of just averages, more about extremes of, of weather. Um, I think it's something that we used to think was a slow motion kind of change. Oh, I'll be safely dead before that begins to bite deep and hard. This will be something that future generations will have to worry about. And now we recognize that what we're seeing are changes that are, are, are occurring before our, right, we're experiencing them our, ourselves. In fact, I think that we're the first generation to know about climate change while it's occurring. And maybe the first to be suffering the consequences of this kind of runaway changes. And maybe, perhaps, hopefully not, maybe perhaps the last generation to be able to do something about it, to slow it down, and to prevent the kind of catastrophes that may very well fall from, from a, a runaway kind of, uh, of warming. Even the name has changed, ladies and gentlemen. We used to call it global warming. 
and now it's sort of climate change, recognizing that it's more than just temperatures that have changed. I think if we called it atmospheric terrorism, we'd have this thing nailed to the ground, you say. But so certainly even the hope or the solution of how do we handle this, how do we deal with this has changed. We've gone from one of thinking about mitigation, cutting back on fossil fuels, flying off to world capitals like Paris and Cape Town and Copenhagen and Kyoto, signing documents that don't go anywhere. And to one of accepting the fact, as President Obama said, hey, the number one priority for climate change is preparedness of the nation. It's going to happen. So, hey, maybe what we should do is suck it up and, and get ready and adapt and build resiliency, prepare ourselves to, to, to handle the kinds of runaway extremes that, that it may very well create. So, in other words, I think there's been a tremendous change from, from climate to weather. And, you know, that's important because we plan for climate, but we live in weather. And see, climate is academic, it's statistical, it's, um, you know, it, it's, um, uh, it is something that, that is distant and, and exotic and, and irrelevant to my daily life. I look out the window and I don't see um, uh, climate, I see weather, you say. So, you know, it, it, it's, this is this aspect, I think, that's very important about climate because, or, or what we're seeing changes, is the fact that we seem to focus more on the weather. If you want people to be engaged and have responsibility, they have to be able to feel it and see it and, and relate to it, you know. It's so, so I think this is an important change that we have, have clearly seen in our, in our lives. We're, we're hardwired to weather. Um, we're not hardwired to, uh, 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 to climate. Now, a lot of Canadians have said to me, what's up with uh, the weather? Uh, you know, we seem to be cursed and clobbered a lot harder and more often in recent years. It's almost the stuff of Hollywood catastrophes, hailers, deluges, ice rains, super typhoons, and, and, and weather, weather bombs, do you say? You know, we used to think that these things, we were somehow immune from them. Uh, these things occurred on the other side of a planet to, to a society different than ours. Um, we used to think 100-year storms occurred every 100 years. Um, and, and so what we're seeing, of course, and, and I think in some ways, it's not that past extremes were more predictable, but I think they were more foreseeable. There were fewer surprises. Summers were hot and winters were cold. It's almost as if we live in this kind of realm of, of familiarity with the weather, uh, this historic range of variability, as we call it. Hundred-year storms occurred within that, that zone of familiarity. It was sad they occurred. They caused destruction and death and what have you. But they, they seem more manageable. Now what we're seeing are these storms are occurring outside of our range of variability. We, we're just not familiar. We don't know how to deal with them. It's easier to create these kind of, um, uh, of, of extremes. Now, for, for me, I think, I look back and I say, you know, when, when did I begin to think that things were a little different? And for me, it was 23 years ago with the Saguenay flood, our first billion dollar weather related disaster. More water fell on the Saguenay that weekend than would flow over Niagara Falls in two months. Um, it, it was, it was a, a very incredible kind of flood, one of the worst flooding and more deaths from that flood since Hurricane Hazel in 50s, uh, till, uh, from back till, till Hurricane Hazel. And then came the ice storm from hell. I mean, in, uh, for four million Canadians, it is still the storm of a lifetime. From Kingston to the Bay of Fundy, more wire and cable came down than would stretch around the world three times. And, um, and I was probably the busiest of my career on that particular occasion. And I was asked to comment and to answer questions from the media around the world. And the two questions most asked of me 
is, well, what's the big deal? Montreal and Ottawa have never looked more beautiful than they do now. And secondly, what could possibly bring Canadians to their needs? We're known as the winter weather people. If we couldn't handle it, clearly nobody could. Now, that same year, I was the second busiest of my career. Environment Canada launched a research balloon west of Saskatoon to rare, measure the rarefied gases in the stratosphere, in the upper atmosphere, the, the ozone layer and other you know, inert gases and, and what have you. And it was a very successful experiment. I mean, this is a research balloon, 15 stories tall. And it was very successful until the very last moment when we went to jettison the balloon from the instrument package and the balloon took off. And my job was to explain to people who were curious to know, where is the balloon? And the balloon drifted across the country. And people were phoning, where is the balloon today? I, I sensed that people were cheering for the balloon, you see? It was like the big balloon that couldn't, you see? It went across the North Atlantic. It scrambled transatlantic flying for two days. We asked NATO to come out. They full, filled it full of bullet holes. But the balloon kept on trekking, do you say? <laughs> it finally settled down in Finland. <laughs> Took us six weeks to get it out of customs, but we finally brought it back to Toronto and gave it a hero's welcome. It had been on this incredible voyage, do you see? We called it the Viagra balloon. <laughs> we got it up, but we couldn't get it down. <laughs> now, we have seen no region has in fact been spared from, from weather misery. I mean, on the prairies, I mean, they've had winter, uh, they've had winter wildfires and summer snows. They've had hailstones the size of grapefruits. They've had powerful winds, uh, plow winds, straight line winds, microbursts, mega bursts. They've had uh, billion dollar uh, uh, floods. And that's just the weather report for Calgary. I mean, what is this hate on that Mother Nature has for the province of Alberta? They've had 60% of the damages from weather disasters across Canada in the last six years have occurred in Alberta. And I haven't even spoken about the Fort McMurray fire. I mean, that was the most expensive fire in the world outside of the United States, forest fire. So it, it's, um, hey, we all have our share of, uh, of weather misery. And the Yukon is not without its crazy weather either. And while I talked earlier about the focus of extreme cold, when I looked in recent years, it's the heat that seems to be more of an issue here. You know, in the past 71 years, look at the temperature changes you've seen in the Yukon. Winters, compared to 1948 to the present, winters have gone up by almost six degrees. That's the difference in temperature between the last ice age and the 20th century, 12,000 years ago. And the other seasons, there's no season that is, is, is cooler. They're all warmer than normal. In fact, we see this pattern everywhere in Canada in every region and every season has warmed up. But no area has warmed up more in Canada than the Yukon and the northern part of British Columbia. In fact, I don't know for sure, but I think there is probably not an area in the world that has warmed up faster in a shorter period of time than this area in, uh, that we're in, in right now. And of course, um, uh, the, the trend line in that uh, period, do you see that uh, period? There's no, you don't need to squint or turn your head. You can see clearly in the winter time. It is just the old timers are, are right. Uh, it's been runaway kind of warming that you've had. And in recent years, um, I remember back in 2018, um, there was, uh, for example, January afternoon temperatures in Dawson were uh, well, across the Yukon, we're above war uh, uh, warmer than normal and particularly not pleasant to the people in Dawson because of the fact they couldn't build an ice bridge across the, the Yukon uh, River. And so you had to, to um, 
find a different way to go from West Dawson to, to Dawson. And it was very inconvenient and it was costly. And, and, uh, uh, but when we look at, the, at, um, at days with growing ice, it's changed. Days below minus 30 degrees in Dawson from, say, um, 19, um, 1950 to 2000, it averaged about 58 days a winter. Now, since 2000, it's more like 45 or 46 days. So clearly, there's a difference, do you say? And, and that is having implications for people. Uh, back in 2018, um, we had 30-degree uh, temperatures occurred in, in Yukon, uh, several of them in, in July. I mean, some of the warmest temperatures in, in five years. And with that high pressure area that had built in a dome of, of putting a dome over the territory, it trapped in some of the smoke from Alaska fires, from British Columbia, and you had uh, many more smoke and, and uh, haze days than, than you really wanted. So what can we conclude from this recent kind of extremes of weather? I don't have a lot of time to give you more examples, but just the fact that the examples are there when you look for them. It's, they're easy to, uh, to spot. Well, I think these weather extremes and disasters are increasingly becoming part of our lives in North America. They're not just something that occurred in Bangladesh or Botswana or Bolivia, but also in Burwash. You know, we're seeing these things that are happening in North America, in Canada, and, and in this area. Canada's becoming, I think, a more sensitive place for for weather extremes, weather shocks that, uh, that could very well be a result of warmer conditions. A warmer climate can often give you equates to um, higher extremes of, um, uh, of weather. It's, uh, and we're, we're breaking records for the number of records we're breaking. I mean, it is absolutely, I like breaking records. I'm a climatologist. But it used to be that you'd break a record, you'd get excited by a half a degree or a tenth of a millimeter. And now it's like hitting a ball out of the ballpark. It's absolutely the frequency of record breaking and, 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 um, um, and, and the distance, the, the difference from the previous record is, is just, it's, it's, it's really incredible. It's, it's almost like, I know it's not good science to say this, but it's almost as if that nature's not capable of producing these kind of extremes. There must be something else at, at play, do you say? And, um, and, and so we also know um, it, it's almost as if it's like, like weather on steroids or something. Like, you know, I mean, it's just absolutely unthinkable. We haven't ever seen anything like this. And, and of course, the, the costs are also skyrocketing. I mean, just ask your insurance agent. What we're seeing is uh, they're paying out more for weather and water than they do for fires in some years, two to three times. And fires is the reason they got going in the first place. We're seeing a quadrupling of the number of multi-billion dollar, million dollar disasters that are occurring in, um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in Canada and globally. And part of the reason is the fact that we have this accumulation of wealth. I mean, the more wealth you have, you have the more property that you, in fact, can... Um, uh, can damage. I know that probably that smelly old basement that I used to store my bike and, uh, in during the, during the winter is probably has now a, a fitness center or an entertainment room. So when you get these little, these big hits, they become big ticket um, uh, items. And more and more us are living in scenic and, uh, and exposed environments uh, uh, by the sea. I mean, a third of the people in the world live within 100 kilometers of the ocean. These are graveyards in the waiting. There's greater targets, greater risks when you live in vulnerable uh, communities or areas like that, like floodplains and avalanche zones and, and of course, uh, near the, um, uh, the coast. And, and certainly, we've also seen that these rising extremes are, are worrying um, governments at all levels. I mean, governments used to treat weather extremes like snow removal budgets, you know? Some years you win, some years you lose, do you see? So you don't factor it in. But now, do you see, it's beginning to affect our balance of payments and our economic indicators. And so they're paying attention to it. You know, there's that government federal fund called the uh, Federal Government Disaster Relief Fund. They've paid out more for weather and water in the last six years 
than they paid out in the previous 39 years of existence. So clearly the numbers are up to say that we're seeing uh, many, many uh, more of these. And even corporations, I mean the economic um, uh, uh, conference in da Davos, uh, Switzerland, has said that extreme weather is the greatest impediment to weather to uh, economic progress today, because of extremes of weather. And you know, it used to be something. I know, I, I've heard it in boardrooms. They used to say in the 90s that there was a certain suspicion about climate change. Now there's an urgency, and more stakeholders and shareholders are asking the chief executive officers, not do you believe in climate change? But really, what are you doing about it? It's beginning to affect our, uh, our investments. So what is behind this, this apparent uh, increase of, of weird and, and wild and, and wacky kind of, of weather? Well, a couple of things first. That it's important to realize that what climatologists are, are saying is not that does Extreme weather is not causing or is triggered by climate change. No, they're not saying that. You can't take any kind of singular weather event and say, hey, that's coming out of our tailpipes and smokestacks. That would just be bad science. So Sandy and Hurricane Sandy and Harvey didn't. It wasn't really our fault, you say. But Similarly, you can't say, were those storms, that heat wave, that blizzard, that um, a result of the fact that the sun was overactive, or maybe it's because there were less volcanoes going on at the time, disappearance of the ice in the north, or maybe it was a, a, a geometry with the earth and the sun, maybe that had changed, or ocean temperatures. No, it's all of the above. All of those are factors in creating the kind of weather and extremes that we, we have here. So often a better question is to say, was that weather event made worse by climate change? And you can actually say something, yes, it was or it wasn't, a certain percentage of that. And what this is a new exciting area of climate research called attribution research, where you look at the event and you're through modeling and statistics, you're able to say, well, what percentage of that was perhaps a result of human activity. And we saw events like uh, Hurricane Harvey, the most, uh, the wettest moment in US history, where that hurricane just stalled there and uh, in over Houston. They have been able to say that through analysis that 20 to 40% of that was a result of, of human, and in other words, there would have been less precipitation by that amount if there hadn't been that, that human um, uh, component. The other thing that's important to understand is that we're not seeing any new weather. It's not as if we're seeing typhoons in Tesla and monsoons in, uh, uh, you know, in, um, I don't know, in, in Mayo or something like that. What we're seeing is the statistics of weather have changed. Events are becoming more frequent, more intense, out of place, out of season. They take a little longer to go from point A to point B. I used to think the best thing you could say about Canadian weather is that it hits and runs. It doesn't stand around and torment you like it does in other parts of the world. But now what we're seeing, it rains on Thursday and it's still raining on Saturday <clears throat> from that same event. It has more time to, to, to spread its misery. So things have in fact um, uh, uh, slowed down. Uh, in these events. We're seeing more multi-element events. You know, it used to be just hailstones. Well, now it's strong winds with large hailstones. Has more opportunity to do damage, uh, more, um, more property. We're also seeing more nuisance events are becoming more significant. You know, we've always had nuisance events, but now because of various circumstances, these nuisance events are becoming significant events. And you know, when you increase that rainfall by 10%, or in fact, increase that wind speed by 10%, it often causes 60% more damage. Because it's not a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. You take that wind that, and pulls that tree out of, out of the ground, but a little extra 10% picks it up and tosses it into a building or to a tree, 
or to a, a car, and you see more, uh, more damage. But there's something else, ladies and gentlemen, that has changed, that has made this kind of weather of the past, of yesteryear, different than it is now, or at least the effects, the fallout different than what our grandparents had to deal with. And it's not so much now where th that it rains from the sky, how much rain falls from the sky, it's what surface does it fall on. We have degraded the environment of this planet um, by several wet things. We, we cut down trees and don't replace them. Um, we are, um, you know, used many southern eastern cities in Canada. The only trees you find now are in backyards or ravines. Um, people in urban areas take great plot, pride in, in taking front lawns and building parking pads out of them, you say. Buildings are bigger. Sidewalks are everywhere. There's less um, green space, you say. And so we, um, we, uh, we straighten rivers. We reclaim land from the sea. Uh, we build dams and reservoirs. I'm not against that. I'm just saying to you, when you build a dam or a reservoir, you change the water balance of that, that river. I mean, in, in 100 years ago, there were no dams in, in, uh, uh, um, in world over 15 meters. Now there are 40,000. No wonder the great rivers are mere trickles by the time they enter the, uh, the sea. And probably the greatest uh, transformation, of course, is that we have also drained the swamp. We have actually, and I'm not sure about the about Yukon. I know certainly in Ontario, it's one of the worst tragedies, I think, environmental tragedies in Ontario. We think it's progress in draining the swamp. And that is the swamp, the wetlands, are the way that nature used to protect us from itself, you say. It, it less, less, fewer floods when you have wetlands, you say. But we think they're just mosquito infested bogs of water that we turn into agriculture or into skyscrapers. And we think that is in fact progress when in fact it has huge implications. And then we have urbanization. The fastest growing land use. I mean, Canada is a bit odd in the sense that we have the lowest population density in the world, but we're the most urbanized. 85% of us live in cities over 10,000 people. And when we go from uh, green uh, uh, space and, and wetlands and wildlands and woodlots and you turn it into parking lots and strip malls and clover leaves on highways, well, you change the water balance of that, of that area. These little hits of the past are becoming major blows. Maybe because the climate has changed, but certainly because we have changed, you say. And so I think that's a, an important factor in, 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 uh, in, in looking at these. You know, flooding may be an act of God, but flood disasters are an act of, of humankind. I mean, we, uh, we create our own vulnerability by putting ourselves and our infrastructure in, in harm's way. Now, there's other considerations, too. Um, Maybe we're just hearing a little bit more about it. You know, the more weather you create, or, or the more, more you educate people about the weather, the more weather you get, you say, or vice versa. It, it, it's, 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 you know, there's, there's more access. You know, people have 1-800 numbers to call. They have cell phones. They can take pictures of these things. Hey, when, you know, we used to say to people, you know, if a tornado bears down on you, well, you should seek safety and security. Get away from it. It's very, very bad for you. But we say, if you take a picture of it, send it our way, you say. So we speak out of both sides of our mouth, do you say, uh, on the, these events. But clearly, there is that aspect of it. But also, the media love extreme weather. Uh, it's riveting. It's photogenic. It's gripping. <coughs> Um, it is something that they know will beat Seinfeld and Simpsons in the Wheel of Fortune in the ratings every night. If you can bring about this violent weather into our bedrooms or our living rooms, you say. I think there's more violence on the weather network than any other station, you say. And of course, you get that atmospheric paparazzi, Anderson Cooper, who stands in water to tell us not to stand in water, do you say. 
we can't get enough of it. I've called it storm porn. It's this notion, do you see, that you see this thing and you, you kind of want to see more of it. I think we're in awe of the power of nature. So could that be a factor? There's no far off places anymore. It doesn't matter whether it's the other side of the world or the bottom of the world. We're seeing these things because CNN is everywhere, do you say? Except here in Whitehorse, because I couldn't get CNN on my, my television set, do you see? I had like 180 channels, but, but no CNN, do you see? So, hey, you've got a good thing going here, I think, do you say? <laughs> of course, something else has changed, ladies and gentlemen. Our climate has changed. We've warmed up. And there is an overwhelming consensus. You can't get scientists to agree on anything. But 98% of scientists believe that the world is warming up faster and greater now than it has in a long time. And this represents thousands and thousands of scientists from royal societies, from research institutes and academies around the world. It represents thousands and thousands of, of governments from, from state and province to municipalities to, to federal governments, except one, the US administration. And they, they're entitled to their opinions, but not to their own facts. And clearly, there's strong evidence to suggest that we are going through, through very warm uh, times. And it's everywhere. It's not just in, 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 uh, in Stevenson screens at the surface. It's in boreholes. It's at the tip of the stratosphere. It's every ecosystem and every environment on this planet is all showing the same trend. Maybe not the same speed, Sometimes it's going a little faster here versus there, but it is never, nothing is cooling off, uh, so to speak, over that period of time. And there's no convincing alternative explanation for the kind of warming that we're seeing, other than the fact that it must be emissions and land use changes and, and in emissions of, uh, of, of spent um, uh, fossil fuels. And, and I think that if it was left to, um, if we just looked at nature, in the last 35 years, we should have gone through modest cooling, not warming. So it shows you what percentage of that is contributed by, by human, uh, human beings. I think human beings have assumed the role of deciding what the Earth's climate is going to be by, by actions that we've taken. And globally, we have seen uh, 2018 was the, um, was the 41st consecutive year that the planet has had global fever. Seven, 18, 17 of the warmest 18 years in the last uh, 135 occurred since the year 2000. And the last time the world was this warm was 120,000 years ago. It's been warmer. But the speed of the warmth, the speed of the rate of change has been just absolutely um, un unprecedented. And it's not just the climate has changed. We have seen certainly in glaciers. We have in Canada, we have more glaciers in Canada than any other country in the world. And our glaciers are melting now six times faster in the 19, since they were in the 1980s. We're seeing sea levels are rising. And they're, why are they rising? Because of the, when they warm up, Water, right, uh, water increases, expands. So we're seeing that. We're seeing the melting of the glaciers, which are contributing to that. So the, so, uh, the sea levels are rising. They're, the water is warming up. And they're becoming more acidic, again, because of, of the dramatic changes that we've, uh, we've seen. And as I've said earlier, that Canada is warming up uh, uh, twice as much in, in half the time. And, and I've already said to you where in Canada it is warming up the, uh, the most. Here in the north, the new north. Um, we are, in fact, uh, the Arctic has warmed up uh, as a whole, as a region, two or three times what the global average uh, uh, is. And, of course, we've seen a total disappearance of the ice. We see that since the satellite observations in 1979, we have seen a dramatic decrease of the ice concentration in the north in the late, in so, in late August or September, almost uh, a 50% decrease in the ice concentration. The volume of ice is, is much less. Uh, we have also seen, for example, the, the, the type of ice is, um, is clearly um, 
uh, uh, different. Uh, we're seeing it used to be that it was all multi, multi-year ice. You know, this, this area, the red, the four or five year ice, that hardest ice that nature can produce, that beautiful turquoise ice. Now, most of it is rookie ice. Uh, it's, um, it's here today, gone tomorrow kind of, uh, of ice. And of course, I think the Arctic without ice, uh, to me, it'd be like Niagara Falls without the falls, or, or perhaps the, um, the north without the northern lights. Uh, I just, it's hard to imagine it. I think perhaps the, that will come back to haunt us, I think. It's our, probably our greatest regret is the disappearance of the ice. Because it's not just a northern thing. Unlike that other place, what happens in the north doesn't stay in the north, do you say? It goes elsewhere, and it's had a, a profound effect um, on, on the world's uh, uh, climate. Now, the proof of, of runaway changes is not just found in, in rain gauges or in, um, um, uh, in, uh, in thermometers. We're seeing <clears throat> in, in, very, in life forms. Um, I always think the last species to know about climate change are people. We wait for the big black cloud to hang over us, but, but in fact, <clears throat> We're already seeing fish and insects and birds and mammals are, are being evicted from their habitats and are forced to, uh, to flee the, the kind of runaway changes. I don't know about examples of the Yukon. I haven't studied it enough to be able to share some of that information with you. I'm sure that you know species that you haven't seen uh, in your, you're seeing now that you haven't seen in your, your youth or vice versa. We're seeing magnolia trees growing in Sault Ste. Marie and Fredericton. We're seeing tulips on Parliament Hill growing six days earlier than they did 20 years ago. I forecast, my fearless forecast, is in 35 years, they'll be holding the Tulip Festival in Winterlude on the same weekend in Ottawa. <laughs> so. Of course, we're seeing, uh, of course, uh, wildfires are burning longer or earlier, later, more intense, higher. Uh, Environment Canada scientists have concluded that in the West, uh, the increase of forest fires of two to six times more in the last 30 years because of, of human-induced um, warming. We've seen allergies. And the uh, health officials in Canada have said the ragweed season is twice as long now as it was uh, uh, 30 years ago because of that. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, various species in temperate zones have had to move northward. And of course, in the north, hey, they move northward, but hey, uh, when you live in the north, there's no place to go. You can't go on the other side of the, of the top of the world. So I think northern people live in with the impacts of climate change every day. The old ways of building and hunting and traveling are just out the window. They don't occur like they used to in the past. And I think that we're seeing it in terms of, of building ice roads. I think it's an amazing story about how they're able to get any kind of ice roads out of the conditions that they've seen in the last uh, uh, a decade or, or so. We're seeing houses don't, uh, are sinking into the ground. Buildings are sinking in the perma melting permafrost. We're seeing windows don't fit frames uh, anymore. Uh, so all kinds of changes to the infrastructure that makes it a challenge of living here in the north where you have runaway kind of changes. More search and rescues up in Nunavut than we've ever seen before because Inuits can't read the ice or, um, anymore. They've had to travel greater uh, distances. And of course, they, the Inuit had to hold a conference about 10 years ago now to come up with new words for dragonfly and robin and, and magpie and cougars. Uh, uh, they'd never seen these creatures before. They didn't have lang their names in their, in their language, you see. So we've seen these kind of, of changes. And I don't have time to give you more examples of these kind of changes. I suggest that if you really wanted to, uh, to confirm in your mind about how things are changing, I suggest you look into your neighbor's backyard uh, tomorrow morning, and you will see <laughs> clear evidence that we're going through, through warmer times, do you say? Now, why should we worry about this? You know, we live in the second coldest country in the world, the snowiest country in the world. I go to Winnipeg and I say, you know, I've got some bad news for you. Your winters are going to be five degrees warmer. And they say, could you make it 10 degrees? Amen. 
You know, there's no question about it. I think the cost-benefit analysis would be to our advantage in the next maybe 10 or 15 years. But after that, it becomes much more problematic. And I say it's not slushier winters and earlier springs that will be our problem. Our problem will be the greater extremes of weather and more variability. Uh, greater extremes. We know that storms are forming today in a moister and a warmer world. And that's the fuel that drives these, these storms, you say. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, it's, we know, I mean, even the deniers have to accept the fact that when you increase the air temperature by one degree, that the atmosphere can hold 7% more moisture. So you're gonna get a heavier dose of rain just because the temperature's warmed up by one degree. And you can do the math, you warm up by three or four degrees, well, hey, those Texas gully washers are going to be more frequent because your atmosphere has got the more potential to give you that kind of, uh, of rain. And you know, this is not just one off. This is not bad luck. This is not just a, a fluctuation. It's a trend. There's no going back. This has been a fundamental change to the climate controls that govern the weather on this planet. So my sense is it's a matter of having to get used to it. And of course, the other thing that I think is important is this increased variability. The wild swings, the jokers in the weather deck, the Jekyll and Hyde kind of personality that we see to weather happening. It used to be, you know, farmers have said to me, you know what, farmers are the last to believe in climate change. But they say to me, you know, I could have I could have had drought insurance and flood insurance in the last growing season at the same time. That's the kind of flip-flop, that variability, that wild card that you're, you're actually uh, seeing. And, and I think that flip-flopping, that weather 180, that weather whiplash is becoming, you know, uh, more of a characteristic used to be that summers were hot and winters were cold. You know, it, it used to be that, um, you know, that you, you didn't, you, you know, we had these swings from one to the other, but they just didn't seem as dramatic as they do now. They just don't, um, and I think that that is uh, uh, largely um, a concern. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, we do everything based on normal weather. We make holiday decisions, we plant crops and trees, build hospitals and schools based on normal weather. You don't build California-style homes in Whitehorse. You build them because of the kind of climate that has been shown to be here over decades and decades. But now it's becoming increased variability. I think Mother Nature is, um, you know, is pissed off. Um, uh, in fact, she's uh, uh, told me so. She's uh, <laughs> pissed off, you say. Now, let me, um, let me give you a forecast. It's not the summer coming up. That's too difficult. But I'll tell you what we think the weather's going to be like in 50, 60, 70 years from now. And I feel very confident about this forecast. Because I look out there, and I don't see a lot of people that will be around to ridicule <laughs> this forecast that may be will go astray, do you say? Well, we think very simply, warmer, wetter, and wilder. Take the, I say to Southerners, I say, especially in Ontario, I say take the warmest period you ever remember as a child or last year, two years, four years ago. In 50 years, that will be the coldest. That's the kind of changes that we, we see. Not so many hot days, yes, a lot of hot days, but hot nights, those tropical nights gonna do us in. We can handle the, uh, it's those nights where the temperature stays so elevated. A lot of tossing and turning and, and annoyance and lost productivity. And, and in fact, many of the big deaths death, uh, from heat waves in the world were all because of elevated temperatures at night. The one in Europe uh, 12 years ago, in Chicago in the mid 90s, where you had hundreds of thousands of people dying it was because of, of really hot, uh, hot nights. So clearly we see uh, warmer conditions, we see wetter conditions, 
Um, maybe not as much precipitation as you need given your increased temperature. So less effective precipitation. That will be uh, uh, an issue. But when it rains, it'll rain in a heavier dose, as I've already mentioned to you. So uh, it may not be, there might be problems with too much rain at some times and too little water most of the time. And in terms of evaporation with higher temperatures, the effect of water, the groundwater, the, will be, uh, 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 there'll be issues there. And in terms of wilder weather, well, our models are too coarse. You know, we're not rigorous enough to be able to say that. All we know is that the conditions that produce wilder weather will be more prevalent. So one has to assume that we will see more challenges uh, from, from that. Now, I did a little graphic here of um, Whitehorse. It didn't come out that well, but um, anyways. It gives you a sense of what the conditions will be like, say, now or recently, compared to what it will be, say, in, in 50 years from now. And so you see things like the frost-free season will be longer by 50 days. Um, summer temperatures up by three, three and a half. Winter temperatures up by almost five degrees. Precipitation up a little. That's one that I have a problem with. Most of our models show this, but there are other models. All the models say upper temperatures going up, but there is some disagreement as whether the precipitation. Very cold days, minus 30, you see a drop from 20 to 7. And hot days above 25, you see a quadrupling of those days. That would be hot days now, that would be in the future. Now, on first brush here, I think warmer looks better. But I think with that warmth comes some serious consequences. We see, for example, diseases like Lyme disease is already becoming a big issue in, in Eastern Canada. Avril Lavigne uh, suffered, a, um, has a very serious case of Lyme disease because of bitten by a deer tick in, um, in her home in north of Toronto. We're seeing uh, invasive species because of these warm, inviting kind of conditions. Uh, we see longer and late, or earlier and later, more intense and taller wildfires. Uh, for every degree of warming, you get about 7 or 12 percent more lightning strikes and dry lightning. So, hey, that could be problematic. Heavier rain events when it chooses to rain, that could lead to, to flooding uh, uh, events. Uh, summer heat waves is a, causing more of those tropical nights, as I described. And, of course, in areas where the sea is, you have higher sea level, more inundation because that Im imposing the strong winds on higher water and more flooding kind of events. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a package deal. You can't get the warmth without the consequences that go with it. And it's sort of like it's not a la carte, it's a full course. And so I think if you vote for the climate you've got or the climate you're going to get, I think you'd vote for the climate you've got. I think when you look at all considerations. So what should we do about it? Well, I think the future of climate change must be taken more seriously. I think just preaching about it or signing documents like the Paris Accord that don't go anywhere is, is, is not very meaningful. I think we'll be judged not on our words, but, but clearly on our, our actions. And I think that the cost of doing something is less than the cost of doing nothing. I think the impacts, the effects, the fallout from these kind of weather extremes that we're going to be seeing is, is far greater. Now, most Canadians that I talk to are concerned by climate change, but it's not a top of mind issue. What I hear constantly from, from coast to coast is the problem seems too big for me to solve it in my backyard. You hear that with other environmental issues. It maybe happens so slowly. It's a slow motion issue. You know, we have time to, to adjust our ways, you know, and, and, and uh, turn it around. There's no clear and present danger. Nobody's dying from the big melt. There's no Pearl Harbor moment here. So why get all upset? Isn't it about skinny polar bears and drowned tropical islands? You know, uh, I don't think there's a need to, to, to do anything. And some officials I talk to say, well, you know, 
Last year, we were hit by the storm of the century. We now have 99 more years to go before we get hit again, you say. Or it's like lightning only strikes once. It never strikes twice. You've been hit by lightning. I say, maybe there's something about that area that attracts lightning, you see. And, and so you, you see that, you see. Um, but so our motivation for doing something about it is based not on what we've seen. It's based on what we're going to see. I think that storms that are hitting now and going forward are going to be bigger and badder and more impactful than what we have seen in our lifetime. And I think virtually every community is going to be in a fight for its existence. There's no immunity. There's no weatherproofing here. There's no safeguarding from wild uh, weather. And overwhelmingly, though, our response has always been meaningfully, but our response has been to, you know, has been not in a planned way. We plan for the terrible, or we respond to the terrible disaster, not in reducing the risk in the first place. Our preference is to spend billions cleaning up rather than spend millions in protecting ourselves in the, in the first place, you say. And then when we build, we don't build quality back. We don't sort of say, well, you were hit once. So we're going to just increase that infrastructure strength and size to get ready for the next one. No, no, no. Your insurance company would only allow you to build back to what, you, what it was. And that's, to me, foolishness, you say. Why not take the advantage of having to retrofit or rebuild to take advantage of the fact that what we know is that our climate is changing, you say and we're going to be impacted more by these, these things in the, uh, in the future. We need to, I think, remove or move from that, that culture of, of, of sort of disaster recovery to, to more risk preparedness. And of course, you know, I'm, I, I, I have to say something about cutting back on fossil fuels. I'm not that kind of a guy. I don't know very much about it. I just know that what we have to be, be better at it. We, we know the fossil fuel of the future or fossil fuels is going to be the fuel of the future. We can't wean our way off of this. I mean, we have to cut it by 60%, but that's not going to happen. But we have to get serious. We have to do, instead of just trade it and bury it, we have to actually become more conservative uh, with it and, and, and do more with less, so to, be, to recognize the, uh, the need to, to do that, you say. And um, I sometimes think we fear the solution rather than the impacts from, from climate change. And of course, what I preach is that we need to adapt. And I see that communities, when they focus on climate change, they focus often on cutting back emissions, um, trying to um, reduce carbon, um, slowing down the warming, you say. That I think is good. I mean, that's all, I'm all for environmental sustainability. But it's not going to save us, you say. It's not going to make your community more attractive or more inviting for residents or in investment to, to cut back on, on just fossil fuels and not to prepare for the extremes of, um, of weather. I want to live in a green community, but I also want to live in a, in a safer community. And I think that we make our communities more desirable uh, if we, in fact, safeguard them or weatherproof them or, or prepare them for, uh, for climate change. And so I think that um, what, we, what we need to do is to, is to develop strategies and policies and development plans that, that respect climate change, that say, you know, I would say, for example, don't, don't approve any development unless you can, the developer can answer the question, well, what impact will that development have on climate change, say, in 20 years? And what impact will that, the climate have on that development in 20 years? It's something that is not a development killer or a job killer. It's just a good question to ask to make sure that people are, in fact, prepared for it. And just don't, I mean, some simple decisions, like don't put, allow people to live where you have flood, floods could occur or in forests that, that could burn up and, and, and without having proper building materials to safeguard your structures uh, from those. 
Um, we often, um, we can buy out properties that are vulnerable. Um, I think that we, we often, the first thing to go in budgets is, is often the, the maintenance budget. I know in Toronto, for example, near Christmas 2013, those communities that had trimmed their trees in the summertime did not suffer power outages at Christmas time with that terrible ice storm. So, you know, simple things like that uh, can, uh, can, can go a long way. And I think that updating and strengthening the building code, enforcing the building code. I live near a community, I don't know whether I have a picture of it here, where, yeah, it was, um, they had tornado damage. Um, and what was so embarrassing, the roof trusts that were laying on the ground were in fact not built to code. So clearly somebody was asleep at the switch and allowed that to, uh, to happen. And so I think it's important to leave natural areas green. Let nature protect us from some of these. These things are not necessarily multi-billion dollar decisions. Sometimes they're very simple decisions. They're, it's not as if we just safeguard communities. We have to build seawalls or domes. Sometimes it's, it's rather simple stuff that we can encourage people to, to take action uh, on their own. So to me, it's not a, it's, it's above all, it's a, abandon that policy of design, build, and neglect um, to, uh, to, to clearly um, uh, think about climate change as a factor in your, in your decision making. And it's, it's not about choosing mitigation over adaptation. I mean, clearly the both have to be uh, considered. So in conclusion, let me say, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think that, um, that human-induced climate change is real. I think it's serious. It's happening now. It's not a murky forecast. This is not fake news. Uh, this is, there is some uncertainties, yes. We don't know whether it's going to be a, a two or three or four degree warming, but we know the impacts, the fallout from that will clearly be um, adverse. And you know, there are people who feel that well, we can engineer our way out of this. We can have technological fixes. And I, I think to a large degree, that's something that we can hope for. But I think we, it's a mistake to just bank on those as being uh, uh, the safeguard for the future. So just because we don't know everything about climate change, I don't think we should ignore what we do know about it. And I think it's not necessarily should be considered as a fight against climate change. I think really rather it is showing us how we can live better with the climate we've got and the climate we're going to get. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Any questions for David? The question was if I had any suggestion or, or prediction as to whether it would be possible to um, have a repeat of the Fort McMurray fire here in uh, Yukon and Whitehorse in particular. Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I always say never say never. I mean, it's, it's possible in what, in, if you'd asked me that about Fort McMurray, I would say, well, you know, I think they've done things to, um, to help cushion the blow, to protect themselves more. I mean, uh, they have, um, uh, maybe I d was initially disappointed that they had built back quicker. They didn't take advantage of the situation to, uh, to go slow and, and build quality and stronger. I think there are some instances where, like in, in, uh, f um, in New Orleans, they did the same thing. They just built back to what it was. I think there's issues uh, uh, there. I think people are mindful of that. Um, I mean, I think there are so many things could, could happen. I mean, I would think that people in British Columbia didn't think that you could have two years in a row where you had some of the worst flooding, some of the driest springs on record, followed by the, or some of the wettest springs on record, followed by the driest um, summers on record. 19, 2017, the worst forest fire situation in, in history. I mean, 30% um, or, or forget what it was. It was a statistic about how extreme that situation was. And then the very next year, it was like deja vu all over again. You had soldiers coming out again, fighting 
uh, uh, floods in the spring that were historic, unprecedented, like the Fraser floods of the 1940s, and then followed by, yes, a later, but a, a fire season that had three times the normal number of fires. So, you know, I mean, I think these things uh, can happen. I don't know enough about the, um, about the forest management in, uh, in, uh, in the Yukon uh, to know whether, in fact, that is, that is possible. Uh, we know that that particular situation in Fort McMurray was, in fact, um, a combination of the driest and warmest fall, fall, winter, spring on record. And the chances of that happening are really rare. And then was an erratic cigarette butt. It wasn't dry lightning. It was a lightning or a backfire from an all-terrain vehicle. We know it was, it was caused by human beings. So again, I, I, I think it's a bit difficult for me to say. I mean, I, I, I have seen things in my career that I just shake my head over, even, even now, um, that I just didn't think were possible. So I wouldn't rule anything out. Yes, sir. What do you think is going to happen to the jet stream? We understand that it's much more unstable. Right. What does that mean for the region? Sure. That's a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't have time to elaborate on it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting, exciting period in climatology as that debate, um, that almost paradigm shift as to what people are suggesting with regards to the jet stream. You know, in the jet stream, just to, for the others, it's a, it is a river of air that divides the cold air from the warm air. It is something that's always on the weather map. Now, typically, it has always looked like a bungee cord stretching across Canada from Vancouver to St. John's cold air to the north, warm air to the south. It has a bit of a dipping and diving, but generally it's a west to east kind of a situation. But recent scientific referee journal articles and, and conferences are on simply exactly the topic that you've raised, is this changed personality and character of the jet stream. And the feeling is that because of the disappearance of the ice in the north, that what, what drives or powers or fuels the jet stream is this gradient of temperature between the Arctic and the South. The greater that temperature difference, the stronger the jet stream is. And so that's why the jet stream is always stronger in the winter time than it is in the summer. I mean, you can have the same weather conditions in Whitehorse as you do in, in maybe in Arizona, you know, in the summertime, there's, there's no difference. But in fact, in the winter time, it's, it's quite, sharp, and so you have a, a, a very strong jet stream. So the feeling is this gradient, the temperatures of the north are warming up so much, and the south, yes, they're warming up, so that gradient is less, and it's causing the jet stream to slow down. So the jet stream is maybe 18, 20% slower now than it was, say, in the 1990s. The other thing is that it's changed its look. It looks like more like, um, like a roller coaster. It takes uh, a little longer to get from point A to point B. And this is related to the slowdown, of course, of weather, because weather hooks a ride on the jet stream, you say. And so storms that are beginning in the west may take their sweet time, the time to get to the east, and so there's more time to spread their, their misery. So this, a lot of climatologists, it's too new. They, they want more proof, but it's an interesting suggestion that um, because of that, and, and so it's really saying that the weather's coming from a different area, from a different part of the world, or, 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 or what have you. And so, so I think it's one to, to watch for. It explains polar vortex, it explains these, these cold waves that we've got, uh, you know, and, and that's, people think, my gosh, there's the end of global warming or climate change. Well, in fact, it is proving that it is a force that it is, you say. It doesn't mean that we're going to be Miami of the North here in Canada in, in 40 years. Uh, in fact, I often say to Torontonians that you may have more freezing rain because of the fact that when you're minus eight and you become minus two, you're closer to that sweet zone. And so there could be more of that kind of thing. So, you know, I don't, don't, you might get what you hope for and it may not be what you want, but clearly the jet stream is one that worth watching it's interesting, it's seen in the media, it's, uh, it's a very popularized part of climatology right now. Yes, sir. Uh, you've had a, a 50-year career in nuclear 
52, actually. <laughs> Well, it's a good question, and it talks about the automation of weather from observing to forecasting to dissemination, and if I had any thoughts, because I've been during that whole process, you say, I've been around for, for more than half a, half a century in the business. Now, to, to reveal something, I'm not a meteorologist, I am a climatologist, so I was never spent a day in, a, in the forecast office, okay? And, and I took weather observations only one week in university, and it about killed me. <laughs> and now I have the highest regard for these volunteers that go into their backyard or churchyard or farmyards to take weather observations for some of them for 45 years. I mean, it's to me, they're my heroes, you say. And, and why I, as Marlene said about the calendar, that was the reason I developed the calendar in the first place. We used to give these people mimeographed Christmas cards to thank them for their, for their task. And, and then I thought, you know, we should do something better than that. So, um, but you know, it's right. I mean, I, I don't want to look like I'm the old school, even though I am. I mean, I like the old days when there were snowfall records from every station in Canada, um, where now you have to depend on automatic stations. They don't always give you the right information. And how do you fill in the gaps? Um, I, I just know that it's progress though, you know, I mean, we observe the weather better than we've ever had. Um, we actually have more data really than in the past because of satellite data and platforms and, and, and remote sensing areas. It's a tough country to observe the weather. I mean, it's um, a lot of hostile environments here in this country, so it's not an easy task. I think from the weather office point of view, I think there is always some concern that the forecast that you hear every day is produced by a machine. It's not produced by a human being. Um, and in fact, uh, they've, they've looked at it where they found the machine was better than the human being. Now maybe where the human is better is on that short period stuff, not the five day or the, or the 10 day, it's, it's looking at the next hour. You know, is that storm going to come here or there? And, and so they, they, they provide a very useful um, product there. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's just the way it is. There's no going back. Um, and um, although I'm frustrated to, I have to share it with you, is the, is the lack of snowfall in uh, observations. It's the one that bugs me almost daily. The fact that uh, here in the snowiest country in the world, we have automatic equipment to observe the snow and it can't. You know, it's one of the easiest observations to make. All you do is stick a ruler into a snowpack and how much you get, and we can't, we can't do that. And, and I understand it because it's what happens to snow, it blows and drifts and piles in, it's, it never stays still. It's a real hard thing in a way to, to get. But you know, you can do other things. You know, you can make buy, you get Dubai with that, and so you have to um, do that. But, um, but yeah, it's been a, a, a lot of changes in, in both the observing, the forecasting, and the dissemination over these, these many, many years. I know there is that. I hear a lot about the changes in the magnetic pole. Will this have an effect on climate? Um, and it's apparently it's changing quite, quite swiftly in recent years compared to uh, the past. I really don't know the answer to that. I don't think it will have an effect, of course, in our lifetime or, or what have you. But um, you know, when you think of the fact that the North Magnetic Pole could be somewhere in southern Canada or elsewhere, I mean, it, it might. Um, it seems that it might have an effect, but I certainly don't know. Thank you for that question. I'll just ask this question here. Yes. Okay. Yes. The 
relative humidity? Okay. Higher. So the question was that this winter, the relative humidity um, has been, because when you say 80s, that's what made me think it was relative humidity. So it's been higher than in the past. And again, it's not something that, you know, meteorologists don't, we, we, we have it in our observations relative humidity, but because it varies with the air temperature. For example, if the air temperature falls, the relative humidity goes up. Um, but if the air temperature rises, the relative humidity goes down. So it's very much a function of the air temperature, and that's why we prefer something to measure the actual moisture content of the air, like the dew point or the uh, mixing ratio or, or vapor pressure. So I, 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 I think the, the problem with, you know, you always see 80%. You know, on a very um, like early, early morning at the air temperature, uh, it means that the relative humidity is the difference between the, the, the humidity in the air right now and what it would be at saturation. In other words, you, the air couldn't hold any more moisture. So if the air is like minus 20 and the uh, saturation may be very, you could soon get it, maybe it would be minus 23. So your relative humidity is going to be very high. It doesn't mean that you actually feel the humidity in the, in the air. So that's why I'm, I, I wouldn't pay attention to the relative humidity as much as the, the other measures of humidity that you might see on the forecast. Did you feel it? Okay, okay. Fre freezing to death, okay. Well, you know what, I, I'm not gonna, I shouldn't open this up because um, I, one of the questions I probably most asked is the dry heat and the damp heat. And even though this might be a scientific audience, you probably won't want to hear uh, my version of what I tell the media. Because really, you know, and I know Westerners believe this with a passion. They say the coldest day they ever spent was April in, in Toronto you say, when the air temperature was plus four, you say, and, and because of, the, of the, the damp air. And at, I always say this, I say that, you know, if you take a day in, in Saskatoon when it's minus 20, and take a day in Toronto when it's minus 20, um, that does occur, um, humidity makes no difference. Your humidity is so low anyways at those low temperatures. Now, if you were damp, if your, your body was, was wicking that moisture, that's gonna make you feel cooler. Um, or if you were, your garment was wet, I mean, that's, that's a different story. But if you were in the same situation um, with air temperature in, a, in the prairie and an air temperature in Toronto, and we know that because in, in climate chambers where we have analyzed soldiers under various heat and humidity characteristics, there is no difference physiologically and sensation-wise when they are in fact moving on a treadmill and the temperature is minus five and then they make it minus 20 and they spray water on their faces, you see. And um, there is no, they, they just don't, there's no sense of that, that difference, you see. So, I think what the difference is, is could be wind speed and sunshine. Now, why it may feel like a, a better day on the prairies, for example, is because normally it would be sunshine where in Toronto it could be cloud. And that sun, in particular at this time of the year, you can feel that, those calories of heat on you. It makes a difference. You know, a, a March sun is much better than a January sun. And, and secondly, it is typically, even though, you know, you talk about wind chill in the west, on a very hot, when you've got a high pressure area, dome sitting over the region, it's often light winds. Where in Toronto, like today, they're going through hurricane force winds and um, with cold temperatures, and I'm sure people feel a lot colder than they would on a day before. So it's a bit controversy. I know I haven't convinced anybody in this audience, but <laughs> it is something that uh, I still get asked a lot about. Oh, you had a question, sir. Yeah.
Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you, I can't. I want to keep my job, so I uh, I have to be careful of what I say, and and you know it's not my my area of of expertise. I follow it, uh, but I I I, I feel that um, that doesn't matter what government we'll have. Eventually, there will be a point that governments will have to mandate changes. They'll be so runaway and obvious to everybody. And I say that even to, to farmers who, uh, who are very reluctant to, to change. And, and I'll say to them, they'll say to me, well, you know, I'm growing crops that my parents have never dreamed of. And, and I'll say, well, that is because of climate change. You know, I mean, there are some benefits. I mean, I like to think I'm a, I think of a balanced approach. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, there are clearly some winners in this. Everyone's going to be affected by it. But I think that certainly I say to farmers, I said, you know, the reason why you've got to think about it and do something is because governments are going to mandate it, your consumers are going to insist on it, and your competition's already doing it, you say. So the marketplace is going to determine that, hey, um, we have to get our house in order if we want to, uh, uh, to, be, to be prosperous. And you know, I think that in many ways, I think uh, uh, Donald Trump has, has actually been a good news situation because he has mobilized people to be able to go the opposite direction, you say. And, and so I think that um, we see in many states, they're just saying to the federal government, stand aside. We're, we're moving ahead. We're doing this because we know this is better for the, uh, for the future. So as I said, I think that sometimes we're scared of the solutions rather than the impacts. And I, I just find that difficult for me to, uh, to, uh, to deal with. They know that, <laughs> but you know it's it's one of these things you can never be sure. I mean, you can never bet the family farm or the fishing fleet on it totally. I mean, there's no guaranteed weather here, but you know, and there, I don't know the synoptic s circumstances with regards to that. You got five centimeters. Well, at least you got something. <laughs> so we, you know, I mean, it it wasn't say a, a perfect forecast. The other thing too is it may very well have been a forecast for an area rather than for your backyard or for your city. It might have been saying that 15 to 20 centimeters in the, I don't know, maybe Whitehorse or the Southern Yukon or something. Maybe that those centimeters occurred somewhere else. I don't know. But um, not to the, hey, there's no question that we do make errors. Um, and um, some of them are, I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> How about the one in Nova Scotia where they called for flurries and they got 71 centimeters of snow? <laughs> yeah, they do, clearly. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's not a mystery. I mean, that is clearly. It's just that so many things can happen to the weather from where it comes from to where it, where it arrives. 
It could be, uh, could slow down, could speed up, it could move to the, to a little bit to the north. I mean, I've seen situations where I live where storms aren't even born in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're calling for, for snowfall totals Friday, this is like a Monday, a Friday afternoon, and people are booking hotel rooms. And, and, and the storm comes up and makes a beeline, and the last moment goes 50 kilometers to the south, and for majority of people, it was a busted forecast. I mean, it'd be like throwing a dart at a stop sign two, two kilometers away and hitting the, 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 the O in that stop sign. You know, I mean, that, it's, it's tough, do you say? But hey, it's not too, they, they'll stand by that, they'll understand, oh, I know. You, <laughs> playing her fiddle, do you say that? <laughs> but hey, think about the, how many we get right. You only remember our mistakes, never our, our successes. So I, I think it's, um, hey, but you know what? It's a good question. It's fair. We live in a tough country to get the forecast right. We don't live in Malta or Cyprus or Honolulu where, hey, uh, the weather tomorrow is the weather yesterday. That would be easy to, to do. So it is a challenge, and particularly probably here in the north because you, know, you do get weather systems from the, from the ocean. They have very different characteristics by the time they get here, do you say? And a lot of things can happen to them, and um, it just it shows you there will always be a job for a weather person. 